Amen. Let us rise up for a word of prayer. Thank you very much. Those who are coming in, just walk in so that we may pray together. Okay, let us pray. Father in heaven, we once again come before you this afternoon to thank you for your goodness. This afternoon I want to invite your servant, Brother Victor Shikuku, to take us through your word. We pray that you may be with us, that you may speak to us in a way that you have intended. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, our choristers. The programs are on. At this particular time, I would want to welcome our brother, Victor Shikuku, who is going to take us through the voice or the spirit of prophecy. Brother, you're welcome. God is good all the time. One, two. God is good all the time. Do you have your Bibles with you? Do you have your Bibles with you? Do you have your brains with you? Thank you. Because as we always say, yes, we want to read, but we also want to to think carefully about thank you uh, uh, thank you so much and uh, I'm very sorry to interrupt the speaker we have the COVID vaccine team going on there those ones who are outside we have COVID vaccine COVID vaccine team outside if you may want to do your last injection of first or second you are invited to be there it takes only one second that doesn't give you room to go away. Otherwise, we have a wonderful teaching this afternoon, and may God bless you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to invite you to our study this uh, afternoon, and so I pray that you will follow me closely as we journey uh, through the scriptures. Uh, the whole week so far, we have been camping in the Old Testament. And today we want to transition a little bit and uh, also study uh, some passages in the New Testament. Uh, before we, we begin our study, I will just want to mention quickly in passing that uh, I have also done a book uh, the book is centered on Revelation 12 and 13, uh, Understanding the Coming Crisis. Uh, there are a few copies available, so for those who will be interested can get a copy. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege once again to study your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit will uh, quicken our minds, that we will understand the very deep things of God. By faith we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 24 describes a sequence of events that will lead to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And uh, these events, most of them were fulfilled in quick succession during the 17 and 1800s. For example, in uh, 1755, we had the Great Lisbon Earthquake followed quickly in 1833 by the falling of the stars from heaven. And so, as these events were taking place, there was a great interest in these prophecies, and there was a great belief that Jesus was coming soon. 
other than the prophecies of Matthew chapter 24, these Christians also studied the prophecies of Daniel. There had been the great persecution had just ended when the Roman church persecuted the saints. And with the fulfillment of the prophecies of Matthew 24, they were persuaded and convinced that Jesus was coming. Together with the 2,300-year prophecy, these Christians were convinced that Jesus will come in October of 1844. Of course, the fact that we are still here means Jesus never came. And so, October 22nd, 1844, was the day that they believed Jesus will descend from the clouds. They preached publicly, and there was a great religious revival and expectancy that Jesus will be coming. This was a joyous message. They proclaimed, behold, the bridegroom cometh. The king is coming. Of course, most of the people who are for of our preachers in this movement, they were not the learned people of the time. They were humble men, farmers, and those people, and peasants, so to speak. And after 1844, and Jesus never came, there was what has come to be called the great disappointment. And many of those who were in that movement forsook the movement. They saw that it was a lie, an excitement, and it was not rooted in Bible truth. In fact, the great religious establishment of the time did not embrace the message. And in fact, after the disappointment, the establishment said, you see, we told you it was mere excitement. After the great disappointment, a small fraction of the people that remained, they questioned what was the problem. Was the problem that the prophecies had failed or maybe they had misunderstood something? And therefore they had to go back to the scriptures to investigate the reason for the disappointment. That small company that went back to study eventually formed the Seventh-day Adventist Church as we know it today. Serious questions come from this background. Number one, somebody will ask the question, how could these people misunderstand so clear Bible passages? For example, if you read Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus says there, nobody knows the day, finish it for me. Not the hour. So somebody will ask a question. A text as clear as Matthew 24, 36, nobody knows the day nor the hour. In the face of such a verse, how will you preach family and say Jesus will come on October 22nd, 1844? Mm. Others will ask the question, how can the Seventh-day Adventist church claim to be the true remnant church, yet it just came up out of a disappointment. Can God's true church be a result of a disappointment? Now, those are serious questions that demand serious answers. In fact, let me put it to you this way. If somebody, if you lived around 1800, around 1844, and these people were preaching, Jesus is coming next week, 22nd October. Now, what will be your reaction? You see, today you say we are the remnant, but if you are living then and they are preaching, Jesus is coming next week, 22nd October, what will be your reaction? Mm, probably you'll be saying, Have you not read Matthew 24? Nobody knows the day. Not the hour. Mm. In order for us to understand what happened in 1844 and how this church was born, which claims to be the remnant church of God, what I want to do now is study with you carefully the events leading to the crucifixion of Jesus and how the apostolic or the Christian church was born, and you will notice that there are striking similarities between the experience of the disciples and the crucifixion and how the apostolic church was formed and how the experience of these Christians in 1844 and how the remnant church of God was formed. 
Now, question number one. Were there clear Bible prophecies that were pointing forward to the death and crucifixion of Jesus? Of course, yes, we will notice that the Bible presents to us so many uh, passages that were pointing forward to the crucifixion or the death of Jesus Christ. Let us, uh, let us just highlight but a few. Number one, notice Genesis chapter 22, verse number 8. Genesis chapter 22, verse number 8. And of course, this is the story of Abraham and Isaac. Which book did I say? Genesis. Genesis, sorry, chapter 22. Read with me verse number 8. It says there, And Abraham said, My son, notice the next line, God will provide for himself a what? A lamb, it says there, for a burnt offering. So according to this analogy that God had given to Abraham, God told Abraham, Behold, do not kill the child, for the Lord himself will provide a lamb. Now, when God provides the lamb, what will the lamb do? Jump to verse number 13. It says there, And then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering. But now notice the last part of the verse. It says, Instead of who? of his son. In other words, it was man who was to die. Isaac was going to be slain, but God provided for himself a lamb that will die in place of man. Are you following the story? And so God was already giving prophecies pointing forward to his own son who will come as the lamb of God and die in instead of mankind. So these were prophecies pointing forward to the Messiah. But now notice that God had not only pointed forward that he will give a lamb to die instead of man, God also told us when that lamb was going to die. Notice Exodus chapter 12, verse number 5. Exodus chapter 12, verse number 5. And now we are talking about this lamb that represents Jesus Christ that was going to die in place of man. Exodus chapter 12, verse number 5. For the context, you can read from verse number one and two, it will tell you that what we are about to read was taking place on the first month of the year. Verse five says, you shall be, uh, you are lamb, when you take that lamb, it says, shall be, what will be the nature of that lamb? Without what? Without blemish, a male of the first year. You will take it from the sheep or from the goats. So now we are told that God will provide for himself a lamb. That lamb will die in the place of man. But when was that lamb supposed to be killed? Now we are told here, number one, that lamb must be without blemish. And then verse number six, it will say, now you shall keep it until when? until the 14th day of the same month, that is the first month of the year. Then you and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at what time of the day? At twilight. So notice carefully that God says, this lamb that I am going to give to die in place of man, it should be without blemish and it will be kept until the 14th day of the first month of the year and then you shall kill it at twilight or in the afternoon, specifically, if you please, at three. In other words, the Passover lamb was to be killed at three o'clock in the afternoon or the twilight. So according to these prophecies, number one, God did not only say he will give up a lamb, but God also specified on which day of the month that lamb was supposed to die or be killed. But you see, somebody will ask the question, okay, that is good enough. We know the month and the time uh, when the lamb, the day of the month when that lamb is to be killed, the 14th day of the first month and in the afternoon, but somebody will ask the question, which year? Are you with me? And now you will notice that God had also specified in the scriptures which year the Messiah will be crucified or will be cut off. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, verse number 26 and 27. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel Chapter 9, read with me 
verse number 26 and 27. Of course, these passages are loaded. We may not explain them all for the interest of time. It says there, this is what we call the 70 weeks prophecy. It says, and after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be done what? Shall be cut off. In other words, the Messiah was going to die after the 62 weeks prophecy. It continues, but not for himself. By the way, when he is cut off and not for himself, it must mean he will be dying instead of somebody else. Are you following what I'm saying? It says, and after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Verse 27 says, then he shall confirm, the Messiah shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the midst of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Of course, those who have studied these prophecies, you understand that actually when the, Jesus will die as the ultimate lamb of God, then he will cause all the sacrifice and offerings to cease. But for the interest of time, I just want to mention here that this prophecy was pointing forward to the year when the Messiah was to be crucified. And the Seventh-day Adventists understand that actually Christ was crucified in 31 AD. Are you following me? So notice carefully that the prophecies given in the Bible were pointing forward to the year, the month, the day of the month, and the time of the day when the Lamb of God will be crucified. Now, how more specific can God be? By the way, do you notice, if you want to show that Jesus is not the true Messiah, he only had to die on a different day. Because the prophecies pointed the year, the month, the day of the month, and the time of the day when the Lamb of God was going to be killed. And in fact, Psalms chapter 34, verse 20, also tells us that when he was going to be killed, not one of his bones was also going to be broken. In fact, if the Jews had understand, understood the scriptures, if they did not want Jesus to be the Messiah, all they needed to do was to tell the Romans, make sure you break his bones. That would have been sufficient for Jesus to be disqualified as the Messiah. Are you following what I'm saying? But that is not only enough that these prophecies, as clear as they might have been, pointing forward to when the Messiah will die, Jesus also told the disciples explicitly what was going to happen to him. Notice Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, read with me verse number 21. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Now, let me ask you, were the disciples grown-up people? Were they grown-ups? Were they intelligent people? Just as you and me? Okay. Now, let's read. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples, now listen to what Jesus told them, that he must go to Jerusalem we will be coming back to Jerusalem. Now Jesus is saying, I will have to go to Jerusalem. When I get there, what will happen? And suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes. Notice the next line. And be killed and be raised when? The third day. Now question. Are those statements clear enough to be understood by an average person? When Jesus says, I have to go to Jerusalem... When I get there, I will suffer many things and be killed. Are those statements simple and clear enough for any average person to understand? Okay, let me put it this way. If you are there, will you have understood? What do you think? Okay. So we are saying we will have understood because it is clear. It is just as clear as saying nobody knows the day. No, the hell. Very plain text. So Jesus says, I must go to Jerusalem. I will suffer many things and I will be killed. Now, question. Were all these prophecies fulfilled? 
Of course, John the Baptist introduced Jesus and he said, Behold the what? The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so John the Baptist is already awakening the, these ideas in the minds of the people. He introduces Jesus as the Lamb. Notice First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. And there Peter will tell us that this Lamb of God was a Lamb without blemish, he will say. Quoting the text in Exodus chapter 12 that we have just read that the lamb was supposed to be without blemish. So John 1.29 introduces Jesus, he is the lamb. Peter says that lamb was without blemish, First Peter chapter 18 verse 19. But when did Jesus die? Because the prophecies indicated the month and the time, the day and the time when he was supposed to die. Did Jesus die on the Passover? Hello? Did Jesus die on the Passover? In fact, Jesus had to eat the Passover meal earlier so that he could be crucified on time as the Passover lamb. And now Paul will say, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, read with me this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Notice what Paul will say concerning that lamb, realizing that Jesus was crucified on Friday, which was on the 14th day of the first month of the Jewish calendar in 31 AD, and then he will die in the afternoon. Then Paul, looking back at this, notice what he said about Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. He says, Therefore, purge out all living, that you may be a new lamb, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, notice the next line, our what? Our Passover was sacrificed not for himself, but for who? For us, he will say. Why would Paul say that Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed? Because Christ was crucified on the 14th day of the first month of the Jewish calendar at twilight at the time when the high priest was about to sacrifice that Passover lamb. Do you know the story? And of course, John 19, verse 33 to 36, will tell us that not even one of his bones was also broken. And therefore, what we are saying so far is, there were clear Bible prophecies that were pointing to the death of Jesus. And Jesus also explicitly told his disciples, I must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, and I will be killed and rise the third day. Now what we want to do is now follow Jesus as he will be now going to Jerusalem to fulfill all these prophecies. Now we want to look at the, trium the, the triumphal entry of Jesus to Jerusalem. Now question number one. When Jesus was coming now to Jerusalem, his time to die has come. Was there a great publicity to this event? Was there a great religious interest that something great is about to happen? Now notice Matthew 21 from verse number 1 downwards. Now we will dwell in Matthew 21. Matthew 21, Matthew chapter 21 from verse number 1. We read going downwards, the triumphal entry. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Lose them and bring them to me. So now, Jesus, the time has come. He is going to Jerusalem. And now he tells the disciples, go to the next village. You will find a donkey and a cult. Bring them to me. So question, who is orchestrating this event? Who is orchestrating the event? Jesus is. He is the mover of the event. And now he tells them, go and bring it. And then they do. Verse 3. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. 
Of course, this happened so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you. So question, is this event connected with the coming of the king? Absolutely. And we will notice that there was a great expectancy and people will be singing, the king is coming. By the way, in 1844, were the people saying the king is coming? And we will notice shortly that the Jews will be right about the time because the prophecies of the 70 weeks was on time. When it comes to the Passover lamb, the 14th day of the first month, the time was right, but we will notice that they will be wrong about the event. Does that sound familiar? Let's follow. And now, the prophecy is saying, the king is coming, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, a fall of a donkey. Now question, after Jesus orchestrated his entry to Jerusalem, was there also publicity that something as great is about to happen? The king is coming. Now notice verse 8 and 9. Matthew 21, verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 says, what type of a multitude? A very great what? Multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of, the, of David. Blessed is he who comes in the names of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Question, does that seem like a very lively movement? And the people are happy. The king is coming. Their hopes are coming to be fulfilled. And there was a great expectancy, a religious revival, if you please. But now the question is, who are the people who are preaching this message? The king is coming. Hosanna to the highest. They were the theologians of the time, isn't it? The religious establishment. Of course not. Notice what it says, Matthew 21, verse 16. Matthew 21, verse 16. It says, and he said to him, Jesus said, do you hear what these are saying? They said to Jesus, do you hear what these people are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you not read out of the mouths of the theologians? Ah, you people, you're not following me. Out of the mouth of the who? Out of the mouth of the babes and nursing infants, you have perfected what? Praise. In other words, the people who were leading that movement, they were not the religious establishment, the theologians. They were fishermen, the humble and the peasant people. Are you getting what I'm saying? Mm. And what was the attitude of the religious establishment of the time? Mm. Notice verse 15 of Matthew 21, verse number 15. It says, but when the chief priests, are you following me? And the scribes, are those the lawyers, the teachers of the law? It says, saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were excited. No, 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 no. What does it say? They were displeased. They saw that this is just mere excitement. And so the religious leaders of the time did not join that movement. They stayed afar and they said this is just fanaticism. While those that are in the movement are saying, the king is coming. Prepare ye the way. But now here is the question. While they were singing and saying, the king is coming. Did they rightly understand the prophecies? You will notice that actually, when they say that the king is coming, in fact, we have read, Jesus had told them, I must go to Jerusalem. And now the time has come. And when I get there, I will suffer many things. And by the way, the songs that are, they are singing, do those songs sound like people who are going for a funeral? 
Of course not. It must mean they must be missing something in their understanding of the prophecies. While Jesus had spoken explicitly of what will take place when he gets to Jerusalem. In fact, now notice how these people were talking after the crucifixion so that you understand that they also misunderstood the prophecies though the prophecies were clear. Luke 24, read with me the book of Luke chapter 24 from verse 17. This is the resurrection morning and there are these two disciples walking to a mouse and then Jesus meets them. Luke 24, read with me from verse number 17. After Jesus meets these people, he asks them, what are you people talking about? Verse 17 says, and he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk, as you walk and are sad? Verse 18. And then one of those whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only what? Stranger in Jerusalem. Have you not known the things which happened these days? So he asked, they asked Jesus, are you the only stranger here? You do not know what has transpired the past few days. Then Jesus said to them, what things? Then they said to him, listen carefully. And they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But now notice the last part, verse 21. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Question, had Jesus just redeemed Israel? Absolutely. And he had not just redeemed Israel, but the entire world. And in fact, do you notice they are saying, and how our chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be killed. Had Jesus not just said, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things in the hands of the chief priest and the rulers and be killed. In other words, Jesus had, had spoken expressly and clearly, yet they could not even understand those clear prophecies. Like the Bible will say, no one knows the day nor the hour. And there are those who are saying, he's coming in on 22nd October. How do you reconcile the two? Are you following me or not? Mm. And they say, we hoped that it was he who was coming to redeem Israel. Do you notice, in other words, when Jesus was coming triumphantly to Jerusalem and they were singing, the king is coming, they understood that Jesus is coming to drive away the Romans and establish a new kingdom. And so they were right about the time, but they misunderstood the event. Are you following me, God's people? And because... They had misunderstood the prophecies, though the time was right, but in their mind the event was wrong, they were disappointed. They were disappointed, even a great disappointment. Now somebody will ask, how do you know that these disciples were greatly disappointed? Number one, we have seen they are singing, they are putting their clothes on the road, Hosanna, Hosanna, the king is coming. They are joyous. But now notice the mood on Sunday morning when the prophecies were not fulfilled according to their expectation. Matthew 24, we read again. Matthew chapter 24. Let's read verse from verse number 13. Matthew, uh, sorry, Luke 24 from verse number 13. Luke 24 from verse 13. It says, Now behold, Two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked one to another all these things which happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. Now notice verse 17. We are talking about the great disappointment. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have one to another as you walk and are what? 
What is that English word there? Our son! Three days ago, they are singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, the king is coming. Then now we are told they are walking around sad. Does that mean they were greatly disappointed? Absolutely. When the prophecies were not fulfilled according to the expectation. And by the way, let me repeat it. Who orchestrated the event? Christ. Are you saying Jesus led them to the great disappointment? That Jesus knew that these people are misunderstanding something, but Jesus says, let's just move on. They will catch up. And so Jesus was leading the movement in as much as Jesus knew these people have not understood what is happening and they will be bitterly disappointed. But Jesus says, but the prophecies must be fulfilled. Let us move on. You will catch up with me. And now the question is, after their disappointment, in fact, if you want to know they were, uh, they were disappointed, after that, Peter says, I'm going fishing. Hmm. There are people who forsook the movement. Are you following what I'm saying? Now question. How was their disappointment explained? What do you think? Luke 24, from verse 25. How was the great disappointment explained? Luke 24, from verse 25. It says, Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Then verse 26, then Jesus now tells them, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into the glory? Mm. And now notice how their disappointment was explained. Verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. Do you notice that for them to explain the reason for their disappointment, they had to have another Bible study. And now they went back, starting all the way from Moses. Where did we miss it? And in fact, the Bible says here that Jesus was leading that Bible study and showing them things about himself all the way from Moses or Genesis. And somebody would be wondering, which verses was Jesus quoting? Hmm? Maybe Jesus was quoting Genesis 22. Do you see Abraham and Isaac? The Lord will provide himself a lamb. Do you remember John the Baptist? Behold the lamb of God. Mm. Maybe Jesus then moves, let's go to Exodus. And he says, do you see that lamb that was without blemish? When was it supposed to be killed? The 14th day of the month. Then Jesus asked them, question, when did I die? Three days ago. What was the date? Ah, 14? How did we miss it? Are you following the story? Mm. Maybe Jesus now will take them to Daniel, the 70 weeks prophecy, and he calculates and he tells them, when is the middle of the week? Ah, they calculate 17, uh, 31 AD. Which year are we? And then the disciples said, ah. We were all this time, we were right about the time, but we were wrong about the what? The event! Are you following what I'm saying? And he tells them, had I not told you that I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and die in the hands of the priests and the chief elders? And the Bible says, after that Bible prophecy, their hearts were burning or they had, they had a heart burn and they had to go back and prophesy again. Ah, you missed that one. And then that small remnant that remained and had that Bible study and the reason for their disappointment was explained, they went out with new energy to proclaim that truly he was the Messiah. We were right about the time, but we were wrong about the event, and now they could prophesy again. And that small group grew to be a worldwide church, the Christian church.
Mm. There is nothing new under the sun. Notice I want to read this statement by Ellen White, then we pray. How she summarizes this event. So this is Desire of Ages, page, five, that is, uh, page 571, paragraph 3. She says, 571, paragraph 3. Listen carefully to this one. The events connected with this triumphal ride, she is commenting on the entry to Jerusalem. The events connected with this triumphal ride will be the talk of every tongue and will bring Jesus before every mind. After his crucifixion, many will recall these events in their connection with his trial and death. They will be led to search the prophecies and will be convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And then she ends by saying, and in all lands, converts to the faith will be multiplied. In other words, Jesus orchestrated the entry into Jerusalem and attracted publicity to that event, knowing very well there will be a great disappointment, but he knew that after the disappointment, people will go back to search the prophecies, they will recall these events, and they will be convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, and from those events, many will be converted to the faith. And a worldwide movement will be born. Now question. The apostolic early church must be a false church because it grew out of a disappointment. What do you think? The Christian church cannot be the true church because it was born out of a disappointment. Do you notice that if the Adventist church cannot be the true church because it was born out of disappointment, even the Christian church cannot be the true church because it was born out of a disappointment. There is nothing new under the sun. Just as the Christian church was born, so also was the remnant church of Christ was born. But I want to close now by saying, and now that church is still proclaiming Behold, the king is coming. But this time round, those who will be disappointed will be disappointed once and for all. And there will be no opportunity for studying the scriptures again to explain the reason for the disappointment. It is my prayer Matthew, uh, Revelation 16, verse 15, talking about the second coming of Jesus. It says, Blessed is he who keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. That today we are still proclaiming the same message. Behold, the king is coming, coming in glory. But I want to end by saying, there are those who will be disappointed. The greatest disappointment of all time. And unfortunately, there will be no second chance to explain the reason for the disappointment. They will have missed eternity for good. It is my prayer that we will wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb, even as we preach the second coming of Jesus, that we will not be disappointed on that great day. And may God bless you in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have mapped out our history in the experience of your children in the past, that it gives us assurance that we have not believed cunningly devised fables, 
but that you are leading the movement. As we look forward to your second coming, the blessed hope, it is our prayer that we will not be disappointed for eternity. May you prepare us for your glorious coming. By faith we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Him 430 Joy and by Oh there'll be joy when the work is done sing Oh there'll be joy when the work is done joy when the Thank you. 
the first song is done in our language is meaning of dear friends are who are tired living on this earth when you look at things that are happening they are really troubling us we are waiting for the seat to come in that city there will be no more sorrows no more crying and these other problems that we are facing they will be not there so let's hold on very soon Christ is coming Musengwe ya jungwe twale makulila o maweng sengwe ino jamarweza no miko watole mugatu wanbile musengwe ya jungwe twale makulila o maweng sengwe ino jamarweza no miko watole mugatu Moshe kosha kule kele shamunyika nishe kosha makatasho sobe na munji tole muka kwambo tole sone kuswamo mawe sengwe ino jamarweza mofole shamunyono mofole shakwambo no miko watole muka tole sone kuswamo mawe sengwe ino jamarweza mofole shamunyono Mofole sha kwambwa no miko watole muka tole sone kuswambo No miko watole muka tuwambile Musengwe ya jungwe tole makulila O mawe sengwe ino jamareza No miko watole muka tuwambile Musengwe ya jungwe tole makulila O mawe sengwe ino jamareza Mushila <laughs> Afternoon. How are you doing? Yes, so we thank God for the session that has just ended. We are getting into the next session, that is the health uh, presentation. Uh, we are used to calling it health talk or uh, getting the health message. So before I read the key text and introduce our pastor from the health department, we are reminded that we have uh, free medical camp ongoing just outside uh, so you are free to go and do the vitals or the checkups and then pastor is conducting counseling at the time of family life session and has been announced before please if you have anything that you need to discuss with pastor kindly register with me that is Geoffrey Nyaole uh, the key text of today is coming to us from the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, verses 13. And the Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsake them shall have mercy. Let us pray. Divine Master, God in heaven, it is yet another time. Your servant is standing before your people to teach us on health. Father, we know it is you who gave us health. May you be with him to speak to us these words and to draw us closer to you. For this I pray in Jesus' holy name. How many together will me help me welcome our pastor?
praise the Lord Church. The Lord is good and all the time. You're looking uh, wonderful inside here. Please turn to your neighbors and smile to them. Thank God we are not masked. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's warm inside here. I hope that those that are watching us from home or following us from home are equally blessed. Thank you for the beautiful singing. We continue to pray that God continues to bless the choir and the choristers for the gift of music. Uh, this afternoon, our health talk is on addictions. And those who have interacted with me know that I'm passionate about this area. One, because of my experience and because of the people group that I deal with. And uh, uh, my brother Mogus was telling me, Pastor, I'll cue you in the right time because I don't want you to get carried away. Yeah, so I'll try to move quickly so that we can be blessed together. I appreciate those who have expressed um, interest to undergo some training for addiction. When we, when we met in May 14th, people enrolled, and we are still following up to see how we can do the training for peer educators and peer counselors. And we would want the church to position itself we pray that the church can position itself to be the health center where we can come and find solutions. Uh, before we begin, shall we pray again? Father God, we come before you again. We don't tire when we call upon your name, for you love us. You loved us so much that you died at the cross of Calvary for us. Nothing good will you withhold from us who love you. And thank you also for you have given us power to be your children. So this afternoon as we want to study or now we can take better care of ourselves or we can maintain our health, we continue to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us and that we may hear your voice and turn to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Uh, the first question when we think about addiction that we ask is, are you addicted to anything? Is there anything that you think you are addicted to? And the second is, do you have somebody who you think is addicted to something? Then if you answer any of those two questions, yes, either of the questions, yes, then you need to understand addictions that you can be able to improve your work with the Lord and so that you can be able to help your, your family member, your friend, your colleague, and work together. Addiction has been defined as a primary, chronic, relapsing brain disease. By primary, it means that it's not caused by any other cause. If somebody falls and they get injured and they're infected, the infection is not, and they, they, get, um, um, they get infected, they get tetanus or any other disease, the primary cause is not the tetanus but the fall, the injury that they got. We are saying that addictions as a disease is not caused by something else apart from when one starts to use their choice. And it is characterized by chronic, compulsive seeking to use. And when we talk about addiction here, we are saying that addiction could be behavioral or it could be chemical or drug related. So there are behaviors that are very addictive. And we are saying it's a brain disease because of the way it interferes with the brain structure and the makeup of the brain. Of course, the brain changes after a long time of using so that somebody is not able to stop even when they want to. And this compulsiveness or this inability to stop even when you want to is what differentiates good behavior and bad behavior. Somebody was asking me yesterday whether if they love exercise, are they addicted? 
can exercise be addictive? The answer is yes, but it depends with what um, undesired consequences you're not able to avoid. If you're exercising to a point that you're not able to eat well, you're not able to interact with other people properly, you're not able to do your duties well, like you wake up every morning and run 20 kilometers and then you're not able to go to work, then it starts to become not the positive thing that it is, it's time to become addictive. And explaining it further then, we have terms like dependency. When we talk about chemical dependency or, or, or compulsive behavior, and for dependency, it means that the person's life, the mind, the body, uh, the family, the work, the relationship have all been compromised. So that you depend totally on the thing you are addicted to. And the two ones that are come here is the obsession. You are thinking a lot about the positive effect that you get from the thing you are addicted to. So if we said that the categories of things that we can easily get addicted to will include drugs and substance abuse or chemical dependency, you could be addicted to sex, and sex we are talking about pornography, or even um, getting to want to interact with people of the opposite sex in an, uh, an healthy way. Uh, and th this is becoming very common among young people because of um, the, the, the media. Not only young, Lord. Even the old. People are getting sexually addicted to so many things. And then it could also be addictions of, uh, of uh, food, food addictions. We mentioned that. Internet addiction. It's, it's actually internet is becoming one of um, the disorders that lately got into the, the manual for ad mental disorders that internet can be very addictive. So we are saying in all this uh, stretch of things that are addictive, the obsession is that even when you plan to stop, you're still looking for that positive effect, positive quote-unquote, or the rush. And the comp compulsiveness or the compulsion is the irritation or urge or craving for that thing. Let me bring it closer home. Those people who are addicted to sweets, maybe chocolates, or cakes, or a hot drink with a lot of sugar before you go to bed. This addiction that can be become very, uh, very common, or a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. I have a sister, my big sister Catherine. When she wakes up in the morning, she must fix. She's not, um, she must fix two flasks, one for the morning and the other one for after 10. And when she carries a flask to a place of work, she will make sure that she, she, she carries some tea. Otherwise, she will not be able to function normally. When it gets to a point whereby anything, whether, uh, whether food or whether substance is making you Emotionally illogical. You're not thinking rationally. Your emotions are the ones that are driving you. Then we can say that that is some sort of addiction. And so when you're talking about the types of addiction, we are saying that those that are common would be food, as we have said. But there are things, there are trade things that are coming up, like the gambling or gaming internet games that also become very addictive. And note that when you're living with somebody who is addicted, you're also in a way addicted. They are addicted to the thing, either the food or the gambling or the drugs or whatever they're addicted to, and you're addicted to them. We call this codependency. And the best example of codependency is when you're living with a, a significant other, a, a friend, a family member who is, for example, using drugs, which is common, and you find yourself overly thinking about them to an extent that you're not able to function optimally. If you're a mother, you find that you're getting late to work because you must prepare the 50 
one year old son who says, Nangoja mama fanya nini? And he sought, with due respect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that you are taking care of an adult in a way that you take care of a what? A child. And this is not actually something that you're realizing that, hey, there's a problem here. Um, and so when you talk about codependency, it's, it absorbs your energy and your time so much that you cannot even be able to sleep. And so it's also a type of addiction. So codependency is a type of addiction. And we, we call people who are codependent, also the other word we use for them is enablers. An enabler is somebody who will know that somebody is addicted to a certain um, behavior or a certain um, um, a drug or chemical or substance, and they help them, even knowing that they are going to buy their drug of choice or the food that they are so addicted to. Uh, many times people live with people in addictions, and I love them. I don't call them addicts. I work with them, and I normally say that it's, it's good that God has given them to us, that we can work with them. Is that we can be enabling them very easily, like um, they will call and say, hey, Pasi, and it will be very easy for you to, after all, he's asking for what? 200 shillings. I mean, what is 200 shillings to this young friend? And so you're likely to just press your button and send them what? To, and they will know that you So they, they will easily call you. They can call a parent or a sister or a brother. And the more we continue engaging them, supporting their addictive behavior, the more they become addicted themselves. So I think we'll look at how we can be able, as we talk about prevention and treatment, but before we get further, I would want us to ask ourselves this question, whether having said that addiction is a brain disease, and maybe we need to say this clearly, that when we say addiction is a brain disease, it means that when somebody takes the drugs or when the behavior is inculcated so that you behave in a certain way, your brain has actually been wired differently. Uh, and uh, the brain structure, mm, I had, uh, yes, uh, I had a picture of uh, uh, the relapse to pleasure and how the brain is stimulated. Uh, it might not be cast. But when the chemicals, whether drugs, and let me use drugs for, to make it easier, every drug has some chemical component. When it's, in, when it's injected, it creates a certain feeling because of the chemical component. And so you'll find that alcohol has ethanol. Uh, uh, bang as THC or tetrahydrocannabinol, tobacco as uh, caffeine and other chemicals, uh, cut or mira for those who love to chew as uh, caffeine. All these chemicals, when they are introduced into the brain, they alter and stimulate the brain receptors to behave in a certain way. Naturally, we are created with a brain that is meant to feel happy without introducing anything. And that's why I was talking with uh, Sarah, one of uh, my friends, and she was telling me that when she does a run in the morning, it's true that she feels like she, she's excited after the run because naturally, you're supposed to feel good and your body rewards itself after an achievement. Similarly, when you eat good food, you are meant naturally to feel uh, happy, I mean good, uh, and appreciated. When you're married and you have a, a good hug in the morning, you're supposed to feel uh, positive about that. The brain signals are sent to say, this thing that is happening to you is really good. Give me another hug. Uh, we have an eight-year-old who says, uh, who counts the kisses that we give him? And sometimes he tells us, oh, I'm lucky to receive, uh, how many kisses? Uh, six kisses every day. Every morning and six kisses in the morning, we kiss him here and here and here. So he, and, and then he says, uh, I, I'm lucky to have six kisses every, every morning, so I get 12 kisses every day. And it's okay. Because they say that kisses or hugs are a healthier way. 
So when you get that kiss or hug, or you eat good food that you feel, you have, what is your favorite food? Yes, that one. Yeah. <laughs> that one. Well, yes, when you eat it, you, there's a feeling, and that feeling is a natural one. But now the challenge of addiction is that it replaces that stimulative aspect of the food and simulates. Uh, simulate is, it's, it acts like you're also feeling what? Good. So that you forget how to feel good without the real thing. People who are addicted to cocaine, for example, or heroin, they said the rush they get from the first shot of heroin, they would want to go and look for it again. I mean, that feel good thing. So that every time they take a shot, every time they take this knot, uh, and every time they take a puff, they want to feel the way they felt the other time. And for food, there's a feeling that you, uh, those who are KFCs, there's a feeling that you feel when you, you pass by a what? <laughs> and those chickens are rolling at you. <laughs> yeah? That feeling is not a simulated feeling because what should, naturally what should give you that good feeling is the natural things that do not have a side effect or a negative consequence. And so when the brain is so compromised that it's not able to differentiate between simulation and stimulation by the right things, then it's so compromised that it's not able to make a decision. And this is what now mental health is saying, wait a minute, alcoholism, for example, internet addiction is a problem that is beyond that person saying, from today and forth, I am, I'm done. I'm not doing it again. Uh, and if that is the case then, can we say as Christians then that addiction is sin? If science is saying that addiction, and I'm almost tempted to ask to, uh, to get a feedback from the congregation on this, I mean from the, from, from the peers. If science is telling us that addiction is a, a mental what? A brain what? Disorder. It's a disease. And the books that psychiatrists and psychologists use to, def to kind of like identify or diagnose uh, addiction are saying that addiction is a mental what? Health issue. Do we say, still turn and say it's sin? What do you think? Yes, uh, uh, yeah, we can share a mic. Or leave this one. Oh, there's a mic here. Okay, thank you. So I think I would say if you look at it, like for example, we're talking about brain disorders. Mm -hmm. If someone is a serial killer, it's also a brain disorder. Mm -hmm. That's so, true. Yes, so um, if people are saying I can't help it, I think we start to have a real problem because serial killing is still a brain disorder, yes. yes. Mm. And it's, I mean, it destroys people and mm. people's lives. So sin is sin. I think there's different ways by which we come to sin, but um, it, like, like we cannot ex say, well, because it's an addiction, therefore we excuse it because it just opens up like Pandora's box, in my opinion. And I agree, I wish, anybody else with, uh, who would want to contribute to this? Do you have something to say? I, I can say, uh, please pass the mic to uh, sister. Yes, and, and, and these reactions are important. Uh, uh, what um, Nyangara is saying uh, is that a serial killer will kill people, and he can say I have this mental disorder. And so I am not the one who wants to kill. Actually, my brain is as a problem. That's why I'm killing. Should you excuse that to say that it's not a witty sin? I, I have two thoughts. Yeah. I, I love, you know what I do. Yes. I'm actually in class. 
I was telling Pastor yesterday, I have an exam next week of psychopathology, study of mental disorders. I'm doing counseling psychology. So I'm revising. So I, I, I normally Thank God watch... For that. You're passing that exam. Amen. <laughs> I, I always watch uh, this program, Law and Order, CSI. Those are my programs. And uh, a case was brought, like what she has just mentioned, of a serial killer. And when they, the investigator did a history of this child, it was a 12-year-old boy, they said he did it because of the disorder and he needed treatment. So he will behave as if he was so sick when he was going through therapy. Mm. And he will fall down, he'll, he'll act out, and uh, he was acquitted. Mm. And as he's being led out, being taken back to the parents, one investigator kept saying, that boy is pretending. Yeah. So as he's being led out, the boy turned and winked to her, meaning he knew what he was doing. Yes. So it was sin. My second question, I am in class. I have gone through the lessons and I know what causes some mental disorders. And I know it's a disease. Can I still call it sin? Because sin is transgression of, of the law. But here is a First person. John 3, 4. Yes. Mm. Here is a person who has a disorder that has been brought about by some chemical reactions in the brain. Why not treat this person so that he does not sin? Uh, so when you in the process of treating them, how do you rank them? Do they, they, they are sinners? I think that's what we want to, to and I'm happy about the contribution. I'm happy about the contribution. I wish you had more time. I, I think this is an interesting debate that we should continue from here. Um, the book, uh, Occult Explosion, by Marshall. And please pick some books there. They are, they are powerful. He has written about a kid called Justin. Justin was 16 years old, and he started feeling some voices telling him, kill yourself. He was hallucinating, yes. Go kill yourself. And he ended up throwing himself into a swimming pool and died. The father was, was um, uh, prosecuted for negligence because he knew the kid had problems. But then he was acquainted because the kid uh, I had seen a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and there was history of mental health. But I think at the interest of time, I think this is an interesting debate that we should want to look at is that when somebody is sick, they are still in a sinful what? State. Yeah? Any disease that we suffer from is as a result of sin, whether, uh, whether um, common cold, whether stomachache, all of them are as a consequence of sin. And we cannot isolate addiction and say, now sin is a mental health, then it's not a consequence of, of sin. But we need to help. And we need to help people who are struggling with the challenge if they are sober. And that's where the mental, that's where now it, it becomes, uh, that's where the line comes in, that they are, they are sometimes, like schizophrenic people, are not able to make rational decisions. And that's where now the assessment comes in. If somebody is able, like you were saying, to make rational decisions, they, they need to continue to pray. And that's why our text is saying that if we accept if we cover sin, that is uh, Proverbs 28, verse 13. If we cover, then we'll prosper. So it's a call for more wrongdoing and not justifying it. And saying that if I'm doing something that is wrong and is contributing to my uh, well-being or my ailment, then I need to change. And so the argument between science and, uh, and uh, theology or, or, or science and spirituality is that wrongdoing is wrong. But we should be able to say that the line between somebody who is doing it intentionally, and this is where now the, uh, um, the, the health practitioners come in to assist us on how to work with people who have challenges. Some of the people with mental disorders, especially at the extreme of the quantum that we are talking about, are not able to make rational decisions. So we should not beat them. Because I think this is where we are coming from. That in Ujinga, Kunaik, Akichapu, Itafanya Nini? 
So you find people beating somebody who is either addicted to drugs because they want them to change. The line is very thin. And the only thing we can do is provide support and lead those people to accept spirituality because that is also key. That all the programs that are recovery-oriented from the AA, Al-Anon, or al -Atin. Uh, al -Anon is for uh, parents and uh, siblings of people who have been affected. Uh, the children of our colleagues also have a program. All these programs are meant to help people understand themselves. AA, the Alcoholic Anonymous. NA, the Narcotic Anonymous. All these programs are meant to help people understand themselves and surrender to God and say, I am not able to do it on my own. And so the 12 steps to one's recovery that we use for, for group therapy or even individual therapy are based on spirituality, that you must, uh, the client or the person who is affected must come to a point where they say, I'm not able to do it on my own. And I need a power that is higher than myself. This applies to all our addictions, whether food, whether internet, we must come to a point where we say that I'm not able to do it on, on my own. I need a power that is higher than myself. I'm not that power, and I need God to help me. So after identifying then, it's important for us to realize that what is happening in this journey of addiction? How does it start? And the process is, important, is as important as, as the, the, the healing itself, that most of the people who start to practice on uh, addictive behaviors or using chemicals start from experimenting. They, they're just trying. How does it taste? How does it smell? And the, is that curiosity. How does this uh, cookie taste? Or how does, uh, how will I react if I, I eat this kind of, uh, of food or if I take this drink? So from experimenting, then we find that it becomes a habit that is socially incorporated in our life. For alcohol, for example, People around surround us who are practicing the same, same behavior patterns with us. And you find like in Kenya, they say it's what? On Friday, it's Fry Friday. So everybody knows that Friday is a Fry day. And they are, everybody, they talk about it. And this is where now it's important for us to understand that you don't have to do it on Fridays only. There are people with their addictive patterns are actually seasonal. They can work very well as good accountants who are able to account to the last word, cost, last cent, and work for three months, but they are waiting for Easter. Yeah. And they know the date for what? For, and they are saving for Easter. And for Easter, they will have a big what? Big drinking. They will actually drive from Kisumu to Mombasa. And they will stop. And they go as a group. And they will drink and drive back or come back or fly back, whichever way. They, they are able to work like that. But they're out of control. So that this progressive social behavior then becomes an instrument. And that's, the, that stage is what we call now the instrumental stage after social. So that you get the feel good, the feel good feeling from their choice, what you're addicted to, it becomes an instrument that, uh, the instrument that manipulates you to behave or act in a certain way. And of course, the fourth stage is the habitual, whereby it's, it becomes part of your habit. That if I don't wake up, I mean, if I don't smoke, I'm not able to sleep. And immediately I finish eating food, I have to smoke. And when I wake up, the first thing that I should take is a cigarette. So for smokers, that becomes almost part of their life. And of course, so we are talking about experimentation, social stage where you interact with other people, the instrumental where you use the drug or the habit or the behavior, and then it becomes habituated. It becomes part of who you are. And the last stage is what we call compulsive or crucial stage. At this stage, you're not able to make the decision or the choice not to stop, regardless of what the consequences are. Now, the reason why it's important for us to appreciate these stages is that experimental stage and such a stage can be navigated. 
You can talk to somebody who is experimenting with a young person and help them. But once it comes to habitual or compulsive stage, or even the instrumental stage, they will need help, sometimes even medication to detox them and clear the system so that they're able to function better. And this is the same of all the addictive behaviors, even food. If food gets to a point where it's compulsive, we, yesterday we were, we were mentioning in passing of the compulsive disorders and talking about things like bulimia, whereby you, you eat and eating is kind of like a way of relieving your stress. There is need to interact with a profession, with a professional to help you understand why is it that you're acting the way you're acting. You can imagine it's true that, for example, if you're having a, a marriage that is not working, eating out can be a, a way of relieving yourself, and you stop and eat. Or if you're having some stress at work. So it's important to say, what is it that this instrument is making me behave like? Why am I eating the way I'm eating? There are those people who watch movies, for example, because movies is an addiction also. Yeah? It starts slowly, but you find that you're sitting late at night watching, uh, I don't know which one is, uh, is on heat now, but it must be some, some Spanyola. Uh, okay. And you find yourself every day at 10, you start to prepare things and to continue until what? In night. And you do this repeatedly every day. You sleep at midnight because there's a movie or there's a series that you must that's addiction. It's a behavior that is very, very addictive. And those people who produce the foods and even the movies will know how to tune them. So that you'll be waiting what is going to be the next, the next episode. I must watch that. What happened to that? Um, that mother was so devoted. I want to be like, like her. You own. You start becoming part of the what? Of the drama. And you want to see what happens. So you'll find yourself watching a movie for three months. From 10 to midnight. And that's addiction. And it steals away the joy of normal living. And so what you're saying is that in case of any addiction, whether food, sex, and for sex, I'm happy that there's some young people who are with us here and porn is is becoming very, very common. Not only young people, even married people. Watching pornography can be very, very addictive also. And the structure of the brain, the same thing we are saying, you find yourself glued in your what? In your phone. And you're waiting, when will everybody go to sleep so that I can get into my computer? And people will think you're really working hard. But lo and behold, you tune to sites that are not appropriate. We're not blaming anybody, but we are saying that we need to be aware of when addiction is stealing into our lives. And some of the things, the common symptoms that we need to know when you're experiencing withdrawal is that you start to become anxious. Anxiety starts to, when you have not done the thing you used to, you start to feel anxious, restless, sometimes irritable. You, you become a very irritable person when somebody gets into your space. Yeah? Lack of sleep, we call it insomnia. You're not able to sleep appropriately. There's poor con concentration. You're not able to talk or study or do. And then depression comes in. And physically also you can start to experience physical things like sweating, uh, muscle tension, uh, this nausea. And this is not only for drugs. Even some of the habits, we start to feel that we need something to, to kind of like uh, uh, medicate ourselves with. So... The question that we need to ask is, one, what is it that I'm addicted to? How do I deal with it so that I can get myself out of the hook? The studies that are uh, about something like uh, uh, phones, which is becoming a very common, uh, common addiction, and people not realizing, in the US studies are showing that 58% smartphone users do not go for one hour without checking their phones. Yeah? 
that if you stayed for one hour, even if it's charged, you will. And sometimes you want what what update, what thing has come up. And the, it could be the WhatsApp groups that we are in. It could be the uh, the the Instagram that we want to update. It could be the TikToks that we listen to. Slowly by slowly, think we find ourselves bogged down by a lifestyle that is very, very addictive. And those who play games, because gaming also is becoming very common. I, 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 was, I was checking with my friends who had started Bitcoining, the Bitcoins, who had started buying Bitcoins. And, and of course, the question is whether it's a, it's a, it's a, a genuine uh, transaction. The Bitcoins, tr trending Bitcoins, and you would become anxious, like, I want to know how much I've gained, uh, how, uh, how, how the coins have, uh, <laughs> have translated. And so the life is completely distracted. Even when it's in church, it's with, when will church end? So that I can check how much I've gained. So all these things have come, and there is also information that is overloaded, and we need to intentionally see how we can prevent all these challenges and the prevention. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has emphasized on prevention. From a long time, there are programs. Uh, I, I, I was thinking uh, of uh, programs like uh, WTCU, the Women Temperance, Women Temperance Christian Union, started in, in, the, in uh, 18, um, 1850, 57, around 18, long time. Women in the Adventist Church have started temperance programs, and they would meet together. The ICPA, which is a part of, uh, of uh, the health ministries uh, in the General Conference, the International Commission on Prevention of Drug and Substance Abuse. All these programs, like the ICPA, was actually meant to be what Nakada is doing. And God has given us this light so that we can educate others. So there's need for us, like we said during the Drug Awareness Month, there's need for us to come out of the comfort and say, what is it that we can do for our families, for our church members? And we need then, in that case, to encourage alternative activities, alternative family activities. I was talking with somebody, and, uh, and uh, she was asking me, of course, without making reference, uh, what do I do with my son uh, who likes to stay in the, in the room? I said, organize for some activities. Say you're going uh, zip lining or canoeing at Paradise. Paradise Lost. Any kid who is 16, 17, 18, or even 13, the thrill of flying from one, the top there, <laughs> because most of the zip lines, yeah, they, 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 are, you, they are up there and you come all the way down flying, yeah. It's an exciting thing for a thrill for a 16-year-old. 16, 16 so we need to think of what activities they will enjoy and get them out of their room. Get, uh, find something, canoeing, <laughs> yeah, or skating, roller skating. Those are things that excite. And, and I think uh, as a church, we need to think outside the box about some of the programs we are offering for the teenagers. Some, school, some churches have started basketball courts, yeah? I hope I'm speaking to someone. Yeah. Why can't we have a basketball court where kids can just come and uh, dribble the ball? And they'll look forward to coming to church for activities. I've actually been baptized in a church that I didn't believe in. Because I, f I was going to play football there, and every time I'd go and play football, I'd find people. And so one day I found this pastor with a, with a gown and people were walking in. I said, what is happening? They're getting baptized. And I asked, can I be baptized? <laughs> that is uh, in, uh, in Isli, the, the, the Fifth Street here. Yeah. There's a church there called um, Church of Christ. I, I just liked that they were baptizing. <laughs> of course, it was my turning point, part of my turning point. Yeah. So let's see what alternative activities we can do. Then let's try to limit social media. I think we talked about that yesterday, whereby we have parental guidelines for those who are kids, and even give ourselves guidelines also, because sometimes we want to guide our kids, but we don't want to be guided. We watch any movie, but we don't want our children to watch. Yeah. So stop 
we should try to stop some unhealthy behavior. Then life skills are also key. Self-awareness. We know who we are. Uh, assertiveness. Those are, those are uh, honesty, coping with emotions, stress management. All these skills are key, and they're not only for children. Life skills are not for children. Some of us navigate life without the skills, and we need to go back to and do a, an inventory and say, do I, am I assertive? Am I aware of who I am? Do I do things that I look back and say, ah, I, I'm not, I can't believe I'm the one who did that. So all this will help us counter the addictions habits. And of course, learning the most important word, which is no. After all is said and done, we need to be aware that some addictions, whether food, whether drugs, whether um, behavioral, require treatment. By treatment, we mean provision of one or more structured intervention designed to manage the health problem. If people have been addicted to, if they have been at the stage that we refer to as the instrumental or instrumental or crucial, I mean instrumental crucial, then they have gotten, their body cannot function without the drug of choice. So you can't, we call it cold turkey, you can't cold turkey them and tell them from today, stop. They need to be assessed by a, a medical profession and then given medication that will help them counter the withdrawal symptoms. The sweating, the lack of sleep, and all that needs to be managed. And similarly, to people even who are addicted to food, they can't just stop. They need some therapy, some form of therapy, and social reintegration. And so the quantum of care for addictions is from assessment. What is the problem? In assessment, you might be able to find underlying issues that need to be worked on. And then the management of the cases, and then lastly, closure or helping the person to overcome. So if we say this then, we need to find a way of developing programs in our churches that will meet the needs of our population. Most churches, especially non-Adventist, have the AA programs, for example. When I say this, I'm, because I, I remember trying to establish this in one of the churches and uh, it was difficult because people didn't think that we can interact with that alcoholics. I said, Pastor. So it's an issue that as Adventists we need to deal with and address whether if we open our church for an alcoholic group to come and meet. There's one meeting at a Better Living Center that we had started in 2011. It's been consistent. And there's an essay group, Sexual Addiction, that meets at, uh, at Better Living Still, that we started in 2011. It's a group that keeps on evolving, changing. But we need to open more for children of alcoholics, for example. Mothers and fathers who are struggling, we call it Alanon. If you have a child who is struggling with addiction as a mother or as a father, it, 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 it bugs you, it, it pains you. When you meet with other parents and they are talking about their children and you, 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 are, you are feeling the pain that I can't talk about, my child. So there is need for us as a church to open our doors and I, I, the health ministries department, we have talked about that. We should see how we can. And also, the spiritual recovery programs. There is the Adventist Recovery Ministry, which has been started in 2018. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has a version of the 12 steps. Today, if you logged in into Adventist Recovery Ministries, you'll be able, it's, a, it's, a, it's an arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Adventist Recovery Ministry has the 12 steps which are contextualized to the steps to Christ, the book Steps to Christ. So that you walk every step, recognizing, I'm, I'm recognizing that I am, I am unable. And you remember the first uh, the, the, the first um, chapter of Steps to Christ is God's love. Yeah? So it builds up on Steps to Christ until you're able to say that I am able to be free. Uh, there is also need for enforcing law when people who are addicted, especially drug and substance abuse, are not cooperative. 
that sometimes you can use force. I know many people uh, have a question on this. Whereas if somebody is becoming very violent because they are taking drugs, they can be arrested by the police. And they are taken to the police cell and they are asked, what option do you want? Do you want to go to the rehab or do you want to go to prison? It's called tough, tough love. When it's not working, we must tough love our loved ones and give them options. But all said and done, the Bible is saying that when we accept, then God is able to give us victory. He is able to give us a new, a brand new beginning. I want to entertain one question or statement before I, I wrap up. Yes, please, uh, let's, uh, let's have the mic quickly. A question. Yes. Now oh, there was a sick photo. What's in there mm -hmm. about uh, mental health? I went to hospital. I, I was in treat with the calf, eating food with but better is in food for the stomach. We are eating the calf, eating the calf, fish for the juice. But uh, we end with we drink for the food. But the food, I um, will eat in food for the stomach. Then we need to drink it for drugs. But I take in drugs. But drugs, I was taking back in medicine. I was drinking drugs. And then I wake up and then we take a medicine for drugs. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I'm trying to get what she said. Thank you so much for that question. The, the question about food uh, be, having effect. For example, if you take caffeine or tea, it has effect. So it has the dragging effect. Thank you for bringing that, that, that across. And for those with um, children with autism, for example, they are given guidelines on what kind of food to, to eat. So that if they eat certain kind of food, then the children are likely to be affected. And, and so this is a common, a common thing. Thank you for that. Yes, I can see there's a question here. Uh, please pass the mic. This is the last one. Sorry. Um, mine is a, a concern as a, a therapist. I, in my talking to clients and mostly Adventists, they say that when they are recovering, they are not able to share their journeys because of uh, stigma. How can we handle that? Because I am here, maybe you are asking for a testimony and let's say I was a, an addict, I come here and when I share my story and how I recovered, I am shunned. So they feel like when, when you as a therapist has spoken to us and we've walked the journey, I, I am not integrated into society. I look like I am something out of space. How can we handle that? Thank you very much. Uh, Minister of Healing Page, um uh, 143. Christ's method only will give true success. And how did, it, how, how did Christ do his ministry? He mingled with people as one interested in their words. They are good. He actually was accused of eating with sinners. So when we mix with people who have challenges as Adventists, then we become what the Bible is saying, the salt. We become their salt, we become their what? Their light. And it's good also to feel vulnerable. And I know that uh, this has happened a lot. When I, when we, we, we call it self-disclosure. If people are able to share about their lives more, I have told my story here last month. I shared my story. If people are able to become vulnerable and say, what you're going through, I have gone through it. But if we were all to become very holy pastors and elders and church members, then people will say, oh, then I can't get to that what? Standard. And I'm, I don't mean that we go and drink so that we can share the story. But if you have a story that we can share, it could be a story of grief, for example. 
yeah? That when you talk about grief to somebody who is grieving, then you're able to touch their, their soul. We call this UPR, unconditional positive regard. You love people the way they are. And they will be able to see that this, this gentleman, this lady loves me. He's not just saying it. Yeah? But, and this is what we need as Adventist Christians to love the way Jesus loved. We need to reach out to the street people, to our neighborhoods, for children who are affected. And to, as mothers, when we pass by them, let's not run away from them. Talk to them as parents, as, as, as uh, young people. Play with them. If they are playing football, join them and play with them. This way then will become the true salt and the true light that the Bible talks about. We'll end it here at the interest of time. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow uh, at the same time. Those who are watching on online, we appreciate you are keeping in touch with us. Please send the questions, uh, write questions, because tomorrow we are winding up. If you have a question, it will make it easier for us to move forward if you write the question, and then we can attempt it. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll bow our hands to pray as we come to the close. Gracious and loving Father, one more time we are before your throne. Thank you for speaking to us that if we confess our sins, you're going to give us victory. And that if we cover them, we are not going to prosper. Thank you for calling us to help others overcome the challenges of life, the addictions. Lord, we know there are people addicted to drugs, there are people addicted to food, and other form of addictions that we have talked about. Lord, give us the heart to love them and to find out ways that we can reach out to them and help them to come to your fold. We need wisdom. We need your Holy Spirit to prompt us to the right direction. As a church, Lord, we confess that we have not done as much as we would have wanted to. Continue to inspire us that we may go out and reach out the way you reach out to those that you loved, Lord. Give us a heart that is burdened of the people who have struggles in life. Families, Lord. Mothers and fathers. Siblings. That we may go out to fetch them. Those that you have given talent and professions that can help, Lord, continue to create this burden for them. Today, individually, we could be having struggles with one or two things. We pray, Lord, that you may give us victory. That we'll go out victoriously, conquering because you have conquered for us. We thank you, and as we go for the family life session and come back for the evening, uh, summon it, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit continue reviving us through this camp meeting and that we draw closer to you more than ever before. We pray this, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Until we meet again. Can you hear me? Say thank you. Um, my wife always says that um, I'm addicted to my phone. So um, I need to see a therapist. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, I hope we are getting lessons that can help us get out of whatever little addictions that we may have. Um, what is our next? Um, our next session, a family life. Great. So we are 1602. Uh, I would like to request us to uh, disperse uh, to our respective um, um, areas of having family life uh, classes or, or discussions um, quickly so that we do not lose um, a lot of, of time. I know it's, it's a very um, interesting session, so I think we can uh, discuss um, uh, from now. Pastor has already prayed, so we stand on that to discuss, and then we come back at five. Thank you. <laughs>